Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The story is told of a man who was walking across a bridge and came upon another man standing on the edge about to plunge to his death. First man stopped and shouted, stop, wait, are you a Christian? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am, said the second. Well, so am I. Are you Catholic or Protestant, the first asked. I'm a Protestant, replied the second. Well, so am I, said the first. Wait, are you Episcopal or Baptist? Well, I'm Baptist, replied the second man. Wow, I am too. Wait, are you Southern or American? Well, I'm a Southern Baptist, replied the second man. Me too, that's amazing. Wait, are you original Southern Baptist or reformed Southern Baptist? Well, I'm reformed Southern Baptist, said the second man. I can't believe it, I am too, exclaimed the first man with delight. But wait, tell me, are you Reformed Southern Baptist of the Reformation of 1879 or Reformed Southern Baptist of the Reformation of 1915? Reformed Southern Baptist Reformation of 1915, replied the second man. The expression of delight on the man's face quickly disappeared and was replaced by disgust. Whereupon he screamed, die, you heretic, and pushed the second man off the bridge. We chuckle, of course, at the sheer lunacy of... Bear with us. Thank you. The wind is a wonderful thing, but it does have a downside to it. Thank you so much. We chuckle at the sheer lunacy of the whole conversation in that story, but there is an element of truth in it, of course. Anyone who's been a member of a tight-knit, close group of people can relate to the humor and the horror in the story. It holds a mirror up to all of us and forces us to see some of the worst traits in ourselves and in the communities of which we've been a part. Journalist once asked Carl Sandburg, what is the ugliest word in the English language? After a few minutes, the legendary writer replied, exclusive. Most of us of a certain age who grew up in this country remember being taught and having reinforced in our minds a certain perspective of American history and mythology. We were raised to believe that we as a nation have become wealthy and powerful as a result of embracing the diversity of those who have come to these shores seeking asylum and hope. The words of Emma Lazarus' iconic poem inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty were burned into our minds. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Yet the history of this nation testifies to a very different reality. It is filled with stories of struggle and suffering endured by those who were here first and those who came to this land seeking hope and healing. The first nations of this land endured genocide at the hands of European colonizers. Even when the Spanish and the French and the Portuguese and the English had decimated those indigenous peoples across the continent and 
the English had gained control of what would become the United States, they continued to organize and build on a platform of exclusivity. Nearly every group that came after them faced the ire and suspicion of those who were already here. Even Africans who were drugged to these shores against their will as enslaved persons were viewed as a threat to those in power. Now as much as we all want to think that things have gotten better, we know the reality is that they really haven't improved all that much. We need only to look at the continuing struggle of African Americans for dignity and opportunity and even life in the midst of our society. What of the thousands who come to our borders pleading for help and for hope for themselves and for their children? We continue to imprison them and deport them. There is something within us that causes us to fear those who are different from us, those whom we see as threats to our way of life and challenges to the stability on which so many of us depend in our daily lives. It's that very tribalism that Jesus most passionately challenges in today's Gospel reading. As we heard just last week, the disciples have been vying with one another for positions of power and influence in the community of those who follow Jesus. They have been fighting over who is greatest among them. Jesus has been swift and clear in responding to that conflict by reminding them that the only positions of honor and influence in the beloved community of God's reign are achieved through service and sacrifice. If they want to become great, then they must move to the margins and serve among those so often regarded as least and last and lost by this world. And yet, just a few verses later, we find the chastened disciples now arguing over who is included in the community and who is excluded. They have seen someone ministering to others in Jesus' name, a person who is not a member of their immediate community, and they have tried to force that person to stop serving. In their mind, it was the right thing to do, because for them, faithfulness to Jesus is determined by closeness to Jesus through the community of which they are a part. Jesus is again swift and clear in his response. Don't try to stop those who are doing good, especially if they are acting in my name. Whoever isn't against us is for us. Every deed of mercy, every act of love brings glory to God. For the disciples, it's been about keeping pure and secure the community of faith that is following Jesus. And yet for Jesus, it is about expanding and extending the community of faith. The numbers of people who are dedicated to doing the will and work of God in this world, Jesus has tried to teach the disciples, but they have struggled to understand both what he's trying to do and what it will take to accomplish the task. Biblical scholar and theologian Verna Hollyhead has written, work for the kingdom is not to be the jealously guarded preserve only of the disciples who were physically accompanying Jesus. And yet that is a lesson the disciples struggle to recognize. Jesus goes on to caution the disciples against discouraging those who would strive to follow his example and do good. It would be far better to sacrifice one's own comfort and well-being than to cause others to walk away from their first faltering efforts of discipleship. Indeed, it would be far better to forsake one's own security than do anything to disrupt the way and will of God. 
There will be struggles ahead, Jesus says. Those who seek to follow the way he teaches will be tried and tested in ways one might never imagine. But they are to remain the salt of the earth, bringing the seasoning of hope and healing to all. The work of discipleship is hard. Jesus is clear about that reality. That's why he urges the disciples to overcome those boundaries that they have erected in their own hearts and minds. There are far more people out there than they realize who will join them in this struggle for a better world. They may not do everything the same way the disciples would or say things in exactly the same way, but they share a common dream for the world, the dream Jesus has embodied and the disciples have caught. Jesus encourages the disciples to recognize that truth and to honor them. That's the same lesson that Moses is trying to teach the Hebrews in the lesson from Numbers. They've complained every step of the journey of the exodus and the sojourn in the wilderness. If only we had stayed in Egypt, they bemoan. And poor Moses has had to listen to their unrelenting complaints and criticism. He's pleaded with God to help, and God has finally heard those cries. God tells Moses to go and select 70 elders from among the people to come and share the burden. And Moses does so, and for a brief moment, they bear some of the weight of leadership, but the narrative makes clear this was a one-time occurrence. Instead, what, what happens surprises everyone. The Spirit of God is poured out on Eldad and Medad, these two random members of the Hebrew community, and they begin to prophesy or to speak God's truth to the people. Joshua, who is Moses' protege, is frustrated and tries to stop them, but Moses makes clear the Spirit of God moves where it will and pours out the gifts of leadership on those whom the Spirit chooses. Moses makes clear that the goal has always been to share the load of leadership, to widen the network of effort, to empower all people to join the struggle for a better world. That's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach and the one that James reinforces with the admonitions to care for one another and to depend upon one another, especially in moments of difficulty. We need each other in the work of making this world a better place, a place that more closely resembles the heart of God. As this pandemic drags on and brings with it continued economic and social and political instability, it's far too easy for all of us to look at others, especially those who are different from us, with suspicion and ire. Maybe they don't think like us. Maybe they don't speak like us, pray like us, love like us, live like us, or vote like us. But no matter who they are, we are all beloved children of God. And it takes all of us working together to bring healing and wholeness to this world. Amen. <laughs>